I think actually if you had to describe the one thing that has never changed about this organization, it has been the commitment, it has been the passion, it has been the ability to understand what our clients require. It's phenomenal. I'm not exactly sure how they hire here, but it's, I could never do their job. Kool-Aid has a mission to end homelessness by working in partnership with others to find solutions that will work for the whole community. You know, we've been around a long time and yet we're still growing, we're still looking at the services that are needed. We have the courage to change. We operate with a lot of compassion, a lot of understanding, a lot of patience, and we're in for the long haul. It's a very exciting time to be working in the field, and I think for Kool-Aid, the next 10 years might show some, some significant change. And yet again, I have to say, you know, it's a sad story, our growth. It just shows how the ills of society have grown. I sincerely hope that we don't need emergency shelters for homeless people in 40 years from now. I sincerely hope that Kool-Aid will still be in business, operating supportive housing programs that will contain people who need homes rather than temporary shelters. That's my only hope. organization, uh, as I mentioned at the first, it was Cool A meaning hip help, was simply a youth hostel. And really the service consisted of somebody's living room and a telephone. If you were hitchhiking around and had no place to stay, you could basically crash in this living room. And I believe the rules were no sex, no drugs, no booze, two nights at a time, and if you can, contribute 25 cents. Well, we had the naive sense that Oh, everybody on the planet was a human being and they all deserved some kind of respect. You know, it's like, I don't know, maybe we were completely wacky. That's a... um, Then, after a year or two of that, they actually moved to um, a part of the Belfry Theatre over in Fernwood. They had 20 beds at the time. They had minimal staffing. Uh, they provided what meals they could. This is pretty much soup for folks. Certainly in the 70s when, when Kool-Aid uh, had a hostel for youth, they, it became very clear very, very early on that in fact the youth were coming and the backpackers were coming into, into Victoria and they needed some health services. Basically the programs were the clinic we had a dental clinic, so we had a medical clinic and a dental clinic, and then we had the hostel. Basically just wanted to provide a youth organization run by youth for youth that would meet the needs of the folks that were traveling and wanted to experience the world. They felt that was very important at the time. In those days, it was a little different. Uh, there was a, a mixture of things going on. Uh, we would let people in during the summer months uh, for all the travelers and whatnot. And then in the winter, it would change to um, uh, people that were basically homeless. I mean, we didn't even call people homeless in those days. They were just folks that were out on the street with problems, you know, and we were providing them with some shelter and food. Everyone knew each other really well, knew what to expect from each other, that kind of thing. Because when you work together for those kind of lengths of time and shifts, everyone knew when to step in and when to back off. In those days, I think it was, it was fairly innovative to sort of form relationships with those people and, and gain trust with them. We would uh, be in the front desk uh, area that had a kind of a box around it, but it was opened around the top. So Mike and I would sit in the office and crumple up bits of paper and try and toss it over the top of the office and into a garbage can. And a lot of the residents that were there on a, on a regular basis would watch that going on and sort of start cheering for us and then get involved and then they'd want to try it. You really have to work hard at, at maintaining those strong relationships with the people that you're serving, I think, is the key. If we can attract quality people who will change slightly, alter Kool-Aid, but maintain the heart, I think we're going to be in good stead in another 40 years.
unfortunately with the need for longer stays becoming more and more apparent, clients shifted from traveling youth to folks that were here living in town, living in our community, but were um, unable to find or keep housing. It turned out as we went through the 70s that many of those folks had more, uh, more and more challenging medical needs. There were folks that just simply did not have doctors, did not have an ability to get medical attention. We started at that point talking about the cycle of evictions. People are coming into the shelter, we're seeing the same folks over and over and over. They'd come, they'd stay maybe a month or two, find a place to live, and then a month or two later, they're back in the shelter. The difference between an emergency shelter for the homeless and trying to create permanent housing, uh, your, man, your mandates are, are completely different, actually. In the shelter, you're trying to support people, you're trying, you're feeding them, clothing them, and you want them to move on as quick, quickly as possible to make room for somebody else who needs that service. In the housing program, you're doing the exact opposite. You're trying to receive people. Yes, you want to help them. You want to introduce them to resources. And you want them to believe that they've come to a place that they can call home. As you can see from this shelter, it's certainly not a home. We have to have rules because we have 100 people in the building. So we have to have people up at a certain time. We have to clean at a certain time. By nature, it's a bit institutional. Um, we need to be the gateway and the door to mental health services, to addiction services, to medical services, to employment-related services, to housing. There is a woman that comes to mind named Audrey, 76 years old, showed up on our doorstep. We weren't sure what was going on with her. Turned out we were dealing with age, we were dealing with some dementia, we were dealing with a variety of things. Uh, we needed to get her to see a medical practitioner, we needed to address her mental health issues, we needed to get her to the point where we could get a public trustee appointed to help manage her funds. The short story is it took a year and a half, but she is in a situation now where she can live out the rest of her days with the adequate supports that are necessary. I mean, if we just stayed with temporary shelter, we were just um, doing a revolving door and we weren't able to make lasting change for anybody. So it was symbolic of getting our first housing project where we could take off from there and we did. We are currently managing eight building sites all over Greater Victoria. I'll start with Swift House, which is the, our first housing project over Street Link, the emergency shelter. We have 26 units there. We had done the Swift. We then shown with Pandora Project, so it wasn't a one-off. We have the Pandora Project, and uh, we have 32 units of housing at that site. We also have eight transitional youth units on the ground floor. Uh, we have the Downtown Community Activity Center also contained within that building. Then with Micah Dora, that was a totally different kind of process where we were doing it without government funding to a large degree. We have 45 units of supportive housing in that building. So with the help of BC Housing, uh, we received funding to turn the Micadora building into the same model as Swift House and Pandora. And we were now getting a model, sort of getting a process going. So after that, we even had things like Van City, Coast Capital, we had the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia now aware of of how we can do things. So every time we build a building now and we say we make promises and we're going to do this and we're going to do that, they're confident that that's actually how, what we're going to do. There's a huge need out there for the type of housing that we're trying to build. For the first time in my experience with the shelters anyways and with Kool-Aid, there's getting to be a little bit of hope. There's getting to be um, a renewed sense that it actually might be possible to reduce homelessness. It might actually be possible to make some dent in this. Some of the cities in the states that have been three years and four years now into 10-year plans are actually seeing reductions in their street populations. I know that Montreal is reducing their shelter beds and um, converting them into housing units. And so there's, there's a spark of hope. There's, there, there's possibilities are coming up. Mind you, I believe Montreal built something like 10,000 housing units, so we do have some catching up to do.